Well, hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. This is Ted Patterson from Critical Path Training. And uh, today we're going to talk about modern SharePoint development focusing on React.js. Gary, um, just want to make sure that you can uh, see my slides. You can hear me okay? So we can go ahead and start up? Yes, everything looks good. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, well, first of all, thanks everyone for attending today. You know, we've been uh, digging into the SharePoint framework, uh, working with modern development. Uh, one of the things I wanted to call out is that for this particular uh, presentation, uh, let me go ahead and follow this link right here. Uh, what you're going to see is that we have a GitHub repository that has the slides, uh, both in PDF and XPS. You know, so if I go in GitHub and I click on a PDF file, you know, it does a server side rendering. Uh, so one of the things that you're going to see is all the slides uh, that I'm going to cover here are inside here. Okay, also uh, there's the sample code. Now with GitHub, there's this little trick where they have a URL. I'm going to go ahead and grab the URL. I'm going to go ahead and move to the uh, Node.js command prompt. And we have a utility which is called git. So we're going to say git clone. We're going to go ahead and put it in that particular path. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a folder named demo. And basically this is just going to push, you know, all the uh, files inside there. If I go take a look at the demo folder that we've just created, you know, there are the slides. Uh, here are all the different demos that we're going to be looking at uh, as we go through. Okay. Uh, one more thing I want to call out before we get started. Uh, we work really hard on our SharePoint training material, and uh, with the SharePoint Foundation, we kind of found a nice place to dig in and kind of take people out of the old Visual Studio building farm solution and SharePoint add-in world, you know, into, you know, more modern development with Node.js and SharePoint framework. Okay, now what we're going to talk about over this next hour, I've probably crammed way too much material, you know, into a 60-minute session. Uh, we're going to start just kind of talking about Node.js, TypeScript, and Webpack because this is the new environment that we're going to be living in. We're going to talk about some of the React.js fundamentals, properties, state, things like uh, virtual events. We'll then talk about something called the Office UI Fabric and its React component library. That's very useful in SharePoint framework, but I'm very intentionally going to cover React and the Office UI Fabric React component library before we touch SharePoint framework just so you can kind of understand those pieces in and of themselves. We want to develop React web parts with SharePoint Framework, and then at the very end, I want to show you some new code that just um, changed a little bit earlier this month when they released the SharePoint Framework API version 1.6, uh, how we can use the new Microsoft Graph API uh, with the MS Graph client component. Okay, we have our work cut out for us. Now, the background to work with modern development is you have to install some utilities, you know, the first one is Node.js. So after installing Node.js, um, we also need to have some type of a development IDE, you know, so installing Visual Studio Code. And we have a setup guide, you know, that is part of the files that you download for this webinar. Now, also, a lot of the uh, folks out there, my good friend Andrew Connell and some of the folks at Microsoft kind of really lead towards the uh, Macintosh you know, but what I've done is I've kind of done everything uh, based on the fact that you're still using Windows 10 or Windows 8.1. And so, you know, let's take our Windows PC and turn it, you know, into a React development um, uh, machine. Okay, now with Visual Studio Code, you have a new IDE that you just kind of have to get used to. And one of the reasons we're moving away from Visual Studio is that Visual Studio is just not a good fit for Node.js style development. We're going to be working at the command line. We're going to be working with source files. Uh, so Visual Studio Code is something that Microsoft designed, you know, especially for Node.js style development. Now, there's this React starter project that I want to uh, start using. So this is a separate project from the one I just showed you. Let's go ahead and go back to uh, at Critical Path. We have a bunch of GitHub repositories. You know, so here's one which is the React starter. So what we're going to do in this demo is that I'm going to quickly take these starter files from something up in GitHub and create a new project locally so we can go ahead and run that. Now, one of the things that I could do is I could download the uh, zip file inside here, you know, but I just kind of showed you how to build something inside. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and once again, we'll grab the URL. 
we'll go back to the command prompt. Um, <clears throat> you know, what is uh, funny is that in class last week, one of my uh, students said, you call this modern development? It seems prehistoric. We're spending so much time at the command line. And that is kind of the name of the game. So once again, we'll have uh, get clone, but now we'll call our other project, the React Starter. And so where do I want to put this? I want to go ahead and put this uh, in a demo folder. And then I want to create a new uh, directory, and I'll just kind of call this something like my uh, first uh, app inside here. Okay, so now once I've done that, let's go ahead and in the command prompt, you know, let's go ahead and move over uh, you know, to this particular uh, folder inside here. Uh, once I've moved inside the folder, we're going to do the old code space dot, and that opens Visual Studio Code at the particular folder. You know, so remember Visual Studio, whether you're using 2017 or earlier, you know, is project-based. So when you're working with Node.js, it's very folder-based. You know, different utilities add different files to the base inside here. Now, one of the things that we're going to need to do, let me go through a couple uh, slides here, is that now that we have this project, you know, on our machine and we've opened it up, well, now we want to go ahead and test it. So note that with Node.js projects, there's a very important header file, which is named package.json. Now, if you have downloaded this uh, package right here and you open package.json, you know, there's really nothing you need to change, you know, other than the uh, name. You know, so we'll go ahead and change that to my uh, first app. There's no reason you have to change it, but you should kind of keep your project in sync uh, with the package.json file. Uh, and also note there's a whole bunch of dependencies. Now, let me call out that this is not SharePoint Framework. You know, I've tried to create something very similar to SharePoint Framework so we have a similar coding experience, you know, but we're not employing the SharePoint Framework at all. We're basically just using things like TypeScript, and react.js uh, and this utility which is known as uh, webpack. Okay, now if I look inside uh, the TS config file, that's the thing that basically configures how TypeScript is compiled. And the one thing I want to call out here is that we've configured the module uh, setting in compiler options to common JS. And that's what gives us a very important um, dynamic, uh, which is dynamic module loading so that I can basically just reference a app.tsx file and it can use import statements to files that use import statements to files that use import statements and it's able to do a recursive crawl and basically load all the code after you point it to a single entry point. Now the other important utility that we're using here is the utility which is called Webpack. Now Webpack is this utility that takes all your source code and bundles it up into an incredibly you know, small uh, number of files. Now, without you having to get too worried about Webpack at this point, you know, I've supplied a Webpack file, um, a webpack.config, you know, that does everything that we need. Now, note that when you first open a project, we're going to need to run commands. So we basically could drop down the view menu and pull terminal. And so now we have this command line, and notice that it comes up you know, at the folder of your project. So this command that we're going to run is npm install. So basically, anytime you pull down a project from GitHub or some other source code, they're not going to put all the packages that you're using, you know, up into source code because they're read only. So the idea is that once you download a project, you can run npm install. And the main thing it's going to do, you can see it's going to take a couple seconds uh, for this to run inside here. Uh, and after it's done, I can go back here and I can see there is a node modules folder, you know, that often contains hundreds of files. You know, but that has to be there, you know, as we're doing our testing. Okay, now the next thing that we can see here uh, is that we need to start executing npm commands. So npm install, well, that's the first one. And we basically run that, and now we've kind of uh, got the project. Now, there's npm run build. Now, inside of my project, we're using web, um, the Webpack dev server. So if I look inside here, notice that I have a build command. So generally, when you're using Webpack, uh, I can say npm and then run. And then either we can use the build command if we just want to build out the project. 
Uh, and so, you know, once we have built out the project, notice that it gives me a disk folder. And the idea of the disk folder is that if I now go into the disk folder, one of the cool things about Webpack is it's going to take, you know, many, possibly hundreds of TypeScript files and basically transpile them into JavaScript and then take all the code and put it in a single file. So what's kind of neat about this, if I go to the disk folder and I kind of take a look at this, you know, as I keep adding more things to my project, you know, the bundling of it, uh, you know, is one of the things that adds a lot of value. Okay, now, once we've got things up and running here, let's go ahead and take a look at the starter project. So what you'll see is that there is an index.html, which is as simple as the day is long. It just has a title and it has a single div in its body, which is React Target. So then we add a second file, which is a TSX file. Now TSX is a TypeScript file. Most TypeScript files, you know, are just .ts, but TSX is a special type that supports JSS syntax, and we'll see that in just a second. But what you can see is that we have import statements, and then we can go ahead and start this thing up and run it. You know, so let's go ahead and back here in my project. After uh, I built the project, what we're going to do now is we'll do an npm run start. And as I do the npm run start, it starts what's called the devpack uh, dev server, the webpack dev server. What's kind of neat about this is it actually doesn't have to build the files out on disk. It actually loads all the files into memory. What's kind of neat about that is, you know, let's go ahead and dig in. Let me go ahead and dig into, you know, something such as the component, which is the app file. And down here, uh, I'll have React Starter Project, and I'll change that to uh, my uh, app. And, you know, as we uh, change this inside here, let me kind of move this uh, over to the side and go ahead and hit Save. And notice that it automatically rebuilds and refreshes. And one of the huge things about the Webpack dev server is that when you have thousands of files that are all being you know, put into one build, it's able to detect the dependency tree. So if you update one file, it might only need to build that one file or a small set and not all the different files inside of your project. Okay. Now, we've gotten up and running. We've got this top-level app component. And you know, what you can see is that there's this bootstrapping mechanism. You know, let me go ahead and move back one more uh, time uh, to this index.tsx file. So ultimately, this code is going to run, and it's going to create this top-level app component, you know, as you can see. And basically, it kind of loads that you know, into the browser in this one particular target. And the idea is that bootstrapping, once you get the top-level app component bootstrapped inside there, you don't have to touch this code because the app component kind of takes care of everything behind it. Okay, so now that we've got our top level component, let's start going through some of the uh, React fundamentals. So what is React? It is a library created in JavaScript for building user interface experiences. You know, it's not like AngularJS or Angular. You know, those are all encompassing frameworks, you know, that want to provide, you know, the infrastructure, the startup code. So React is not quite as aggressive in what it tries to do. It just focuses on building HTML-based user experiences. And quite often, your React application is just a rectangle on a page, you know, as opposed to a whole page or a whole website. And it's based on this notion of reusable components. So the top-level app is a component. The toolbar is a component. And what's nice is if you build a component and a child component, and that child component has grandchild components, all the implementation details can be hidden from the components up top. So it just gives us this idea of building kind of black boxes to basically build out the UI, which leads to something that's very maintainable. Now, with our components, we're going to see that there's properties and state, and we're going to kind of use properties and state to create the UI experience. And also, React has this special, what's called a shadow DOM. So you'll be creating something like a button or a text box, and you'll be doing that in the render method. But the render method might continually fire. 
So what's neat about that is if your render method fires 10 times and you basically creating the same button every time, it creates the button the first time, but then every other time it sees that there's no change between the actual DOM and the virtual DOM it's maintaining. And that alone gives us this huge performance advantage as you have pages that are really, really large. Now, React was originally designed for Facebook. And you can imagine that components you know, on those pages are really busy. And if you create a component that tries to you know, do a query of the entire DOM on the page, it's going to really kill performance. You know, so React you know, was created really to kind of give us a high performance component. And because of all its characteristics, high performance, easy to program, uh, and great for creating rectangles, you know, it's a great fit for building SharePoint Framework web parts. Now, if you've worked with React, you might have seen this Hello World example. And this Hello World example, you know, just uses regular old JavaScript, you know, ES5. But it kind of shows you how you can get up and going. But let's kind of move ahead. Now, there's the React and the React DOM. So the React DOM is a package specifically for the browser. And they have other packages other than React DOM for running on things like iOS. So the React package is used by everybody. The React DOM is just used when we want to host React you know, inside of the browser. Now, another big problem that many of us will face is that there's some great articles out there about React. There's a couple good books. But there's three ways to program with React. There is kind of the old JavaScript, ES5 way to do it. There is the newer JavaScript, ES6, and then there's the way to do it in TypeScript. But you'll find none of the books really cover the TypeScript. But the syntax is not easy to learn. Uh, but once you learn it, you'll find it's very slick and elegant. You know, so as you start learning this, you need specifically to learn about how to use React.js when you're using TypeScript. So here's an example. I want to create a component. So first of all, inside of a TSX file, we say import star as React from React. And then I can create a class. My component extends react.component. And the only real requirement for a React component is that you render the, is you implement the render method. Now you've seen that. Next thing we want to talk about is JSX. So the idea of JSX, you know, let me go back here. And with our application that we're running here, you know, once again, I should be able to make a quick change. But let's go into uh, app.tx. And notice that, you know, what we have here uh, is some text. You know, maybe I want to go ahead and cut some of that stuff out uh, and hit save inside there. You know, so the idea is you're working in a typely uh, or strongly typed uh, file. Uh, let's go ahead and put uh, div inside here. Uh, this is a uh, test. The old shift alt F5 is your friend because it will kind of get you back in line. Uh, now let's go ahead and have a uh, unordered uh, list inside here. And now we'll have some uh, list items, uh, item one. Uh, but what we're doing is we're basically writing uh, HTML code, you know, but in a TypeScript file. So you get some really neat benefits uh, as far as working with that. Yeah. So what is going to take a little bit of time, you know, is kind of getting up on the JSX syntax. Uh, but what you'll find is that once you get up to speed on it, you'll just love how easy it is and how the compiler, and it's a TypeScript compiler that compiles TSX uh, into HTML code. You know, it just does a lot of benefits for you. Okay. So now that we've seen JSX, let's talk about component properties and component state. So when you create a component, you design the properties and state. So when you design a component that has a property, think of the property as being initialized by the external component. Typically, the creator of a component is able to pass property values to the component that it is instantiating. Okay, now properties to the, your component are read-only. You know, generally, another component will create your component. So your component takes properties but doesn't update them. And the outside world might update a property to which your component can respond to that. So state is what it's all about. When you have a component, you will create state 
And the idea is that once the state of your application changes, well, that will trigger a call to basically rerun the render method. Okay, now the experience is something where you define state, you have different things that change state, and every time we change the state, our, update, our UI uh, just updates accordingly. Okay, now let's look at an example. Let's say we want to have just the simplest component for our test. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to define one interface that has the properties, I being counter props, starting count number, and then the state for my component will define another interface. So it's a little bit strange at first to define the interfaces and then pass them uh, when you are extending React component. But once you get used to it, what you'll find is that inside the class, the properties and the state just show up automatically. Okay, now let's go ahead and uh, do an example. So let's go back to the project that I've created right here. And so let me go ahead and get rid of something that doesn't need to be there. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, inside uh, of uh, this project uh, right here. Um, okay, that is not what I meant to do inside there. Let me see if I can quickly... Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I think I just deleted something by mistake. Um, if I go back uh, here and uh, open uh, the recycle bin and components and restore and don't do that at home. Okay, but what we have now, um, I just meant to delete this one file up here that doesn't need to be there. Okay, now if we go into uh, the components folder, you know, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to add a, another component. Now, um, <clears throat> I've got some uh, code here. Let's see if I can run through this. So what I'm going to do is try to uh, do this demo where I go back to um, <clears throat> the GitHub repository. Okay, let's go back into what we're looking at. And I have some demo one snippets. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to create two new files. So we're going to create one new file, and this is going to be the bean uh, counter.tsx file. You know, so that's going to be the React component. Uh, but then we want one other file, and that's going to be the uh, bean uh, counter.scss. So there is something which is known as scss files which is basically a uh, more advanced style of CSS style definition. Okay, now with this inside here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly steal some code. You know, so if I go to uh, beancounter.txs and raw, and now I can kind of just take this uh, code right here. And if I've prepared my demo correctly, uh, let's go ahead and add this inside. Also, I am going to... Uh, come back here to bean counter uh, dot CSS and I also you know very much created this demo so you can kind of do the same thing okay now let's go ahead and put this inside here okay so first of all we want to basically have some CSS so we're able to use what's called stylistically awesome style sheets to add something inside there uh, that's uh, great inside if I go to uh, the bean counter you know what you can see here is that with the bean counter, uh, we have something uh, where we have two interfaces, one for properties, we pass in a starting count, and then we have the number inside here. Now, let's kind of finish up uh, by going down here, and what we're going to do is let's go into the uh, body content. We'll get rid of uh, everything that's there, but now up top here, we're, we want to basically import this component. So we're going to say import, and the name of our component is uh, bean uh, counter. And, you know, where is that from? And so if I say from dot, uh, note that uh, as uh, we come down uh, inside here, uh, and cannot find module component app. Uh, okay, so... Let me quickly go to my contingency plan of uh, opening up the, um, 
Okay, and I just realized I have a small issue here. Okay, let me kind of quickly get through this uh, for this particular demo. Okay, one more second. Here's the bean counter. <clears throat> so we'll put uh, that inside here. Now for the app.tsx. Let me get down into that and grab that code inside here. And if I look at the uh, app.tsx here, uh, what you can see is that we want to import um, the uh, bean counter inside there. Okay, and the idea is that once you have done that, now what we can do is just to kind of use that uh, inside. Now, let's go ahead and do a uh, save all. Uh, and as we do a uh, save all inside here, let's get back uh, and CLS. And now one more time, we'll do an NPM uh, run start. And, you know, now we should have our bean counter component. Okay, once again, you know, I've tried very much to make it so you can recreate these. And the idea is we want to be able to click on this right here. You know, so how was all this brought together? So first of all, you design the interface for the properties and the state. And there's only one piece of state we really care about, which is the count of beans. But quite often you have a property that's passing the default or starting count. You know, so make sure you don't call both the initialization property count and the state property count. We have starting count. And also note down here, uh, you know, that you can either use the constructor syntax or what's a little bit more concise is just to say public state and you can go ahead and initialize that. Now, once we've done that, the whole idea is creating the render method. And the render method uses state and displays it. But now we need something to kind of trigger the change in state. And that is what brings in the virtual DOM. So note that you have things like buttons that have DOM events. And note that if I was in the browser, you would use on click and C of click would be small case. But now on click with the uppercase C is the React specific synthetic event. And note that I can just go ahead and add my inline code inside there. And so what's going to happen? Well, now we're going to basically uh, react to you know that event by calling set state. And when I call set state, I set it to a new state inside there. And now you're kind of seeing the big picture uh, of how things work inside there. Uh, note that just for fun, uh, if I go back here and I create a second and a third uh, you know, and a uh, fourth uh, bean counter inside there. Uh, that uh, there's no problem, you know, creating uh, multiple components in here. Let's see if I can get that. Uh, and we'll have this other one starting at 10. And now we'll go ahead uh, and run that right here. Okay. You know, so the idea is that. Uh, <coughs> running one more time, you know, once you have these components on a page, you know, it's a pretty straight ahead uh, process, you know, for you to be able to have components, you know, that are completely isolated from the other components uh, on the page. Okay, now let's keep going through. You know, we basically looked at a lot of things, but now we've just kind of got started. So my first application had two components, the app component and the bean counter. Now let's kind of create something that's more of a, you know, real world application. So what we'll do is let's go ahead and close down the uh, project that I'm working with here. And we're going to open a separate folder. And this is going to be, you know, inside of our demo folder. And this one is going to be the customer search. So we'll go ahead and open this up. You know, you should now kind of get used to open a new project. Uh, we can either choose the uh, terminal or also note control uh, and the back tick, you know, is the kind of the quick way to bring up and remove the terminal. Okay, once we have the terminal, first thing we're going to do, npm install. Let's go ahead and um, download all the files inside of the node modules folder so I can basically kick this thing off uh, and start running it inside. Now, with this particular uh, project right here, uh, 
what we're going to uh, do, let's go ahead and do an NPM uh, run uh, start. And so this should start up this project inside here. And so inside of this project, note that we have a couple different components, you know, that we're building out. So let's go ahead and look under source and under components. And notice that I have an app. Okay, and then we have a banner. You know, so now what we'll see is that the application is structured so that we have a top level app, we have a banner. Notice that within the banner, you can stick a top nav and then we'll have a main view down below. And once again, you know, as you create the banner, the CSS for the banner and all the code for the banner, you know, is completely isolated, you know, from all the other code for the application. Now, with this particular application, we also wanted to demonstrate, you know, going and having a customer search experience inside there. Uh, you know, so also, you know, we're able to, uh, you know, call across the network uh, and just see users to start with G uh, or G A T. You know, so once again, you know, just trying to come up with kind of a neat user interface experience. So with this particular project, some of the things I want to point out is that we're using the React router. So when you create single page applications, you know, and that's the reason that we really like to use React JS. Uh, one of the things that you might want to do is have something where if someone goes to the home page or the about page uh, or the customers page, you know, that there is a specific route that I could send someone a link to or someone could bookmark and get back to that particular place. So the React router is something that has, a, it's a package that has several different routers. You know, the one I'm using here is the hash router. The hash router works without any server-side support. There's also a browser router that's a little bit better, you know, but it requires some Node.js packages uh, with server-side support inside there. Okay, you know, but the basic idea is that once you have the React router, we can start importing components. There's the route component and the switch component. And so what we're able to do is inside of app.tsx, we're just able to add the switch component and I'm able to map out these particular paths. And what's kind of neat about this is, you know, note that we have the word component right here. And that basically just points to one of our particular views. So, you know, back inside of this project, you know, we kind of have to think about how we structure things. So the way I've structured it is that we have a couple components uh, that live at the top of the components folder. You know, but anytime we have a view, you know, like about, we tuck things inside there. And what's kind of neat about this is, you know, as I deal drive into the customer's view right here. The customer's view doesn't seem complicated to the other components that use it. But once we get into, you know, that customer's view, you know, what we're going to see is that we have a customer toolbar, we have a customer table, we have a customer card. You know, so once again, you know, back here, uh, you know, having a toolbar up here, you know, being able to kind of quickly switch back and forth between kind of a table view uh, and a card view and things like that. You know, those are the kind of things, you know, I'm hoping to, um, you know, have you run the demo and kind of see how you build out that component hierarchy. Okay. Now, in addition to some of the components like the router component, another very important thing is understanding the React component lifecycle methods. So in particular, these methods fire automatically. You don't call them. They're called by the framework and they run at particular times. You know, so if you've used jQuery and you're used to the document ready event handler, you know, some of these things will give you the same thing, such as component did mount. And the idea is that once the component has been created inside the browser and we know it's not going to fail, well, then they will basically call component did mount if you have that inside. Now, let's go back here and let's go ahead and look at the view component. You know, so inside of the view component, there's the render method, but then is component did mount. So the idea is that you render your UI and it typically renders without any data, but then what's going to happen is you're going to call component did mount. So here we might set state to say loading, you know, equals uh, true, you know, to show some type of indication we're loading. But then we have a data access 
uh, uh, piece of code that we've written. We're going to call out to that. Now, another thing to note about this demo and the other demos I'm going to show is that we don't just go behind a web part and start writing data access code. You know, instead, what we'd like to do is have interfaces. You know, so here's how we define what a customer object looks like. Here's how we define what a service class that serves up customers look like with iCustomer service. Okay. And now, once we've done that, we can create our service classes inside here. You know, here's a mock service class. If you've been through any of the Microsoft tutorials, they're real big on creating a mock service class so we can kind of get our UI code together uh, without having to, you know, actually call into an API. You know, but now here is the customer's service class inside here. And one of the things that gets to be a little bit tricky, you know, is how do we actually, uh, you know, get the objects out there. Now, in this case right here, we're not in SharePoint yet. So we're just basically using the React Fetch API. You know, but the idea is that, you know, by handling these lifecycle methods, you know, let's go uh, move this across here. Let me go ahead uh, and bring up our friend Fiddler. And so, you know, now as I go through here and I start searching for people whose name starts with, uh, you know, A, uh, you know, and uh, B inside here, uh, you know, what we should see here, if Ted would only fix the filters. Okay, so I basically am using filters to not show everything. Let me go ahead and uh, change that inside there. Okay, but now uh, as I come back here, you know, and typing, and you can kind of see that we're calling a web service behind the scenes. And one thing I want you to really kind of keep in mind is this is making calls out to a web service. You know, arguably it's a web service that doesn't require authentication, so it's a little faster. Uh, you know, but look how snappy the UI experience is, you know, compared to when you use libraries that aren't React. And I think you'll, you know, find that, you know, it gives a very slick uh, user experience. Okay. So we just kind of walk through, you know, how to call into a web service using the Fetch API. Now, the next thing I want to do is to talk about using the Office UI Fabric React Component Library. Now, before I jump into the slides, let's go ahead and uh, close everything I've been working on. And let's go ahead and close down uh, this particular project. And now let's go back over to uh, open a uh, folder right here. And so we're going to open this folder you know, which is the Demo 3 Office UI Fabric. And now we should be pretty practiced of uh, what's the first thing when we open the project we want to do, npm install. Let's go ahead uh, and install this inside here. Now, what I want to show you is how we can leverage the Office UI Fabric. Now, it gives us a couple things. It gives us a set of styles. It's kind of like Bootstrap, and that's what the Fabric Core is, CSS styles. Now, it's not as extensive as Bootstrap. You know, it doesn't give me the CSS styles to kind of create the application uh, structure itself. You know, but it gives me lots of styling options, and they're the exact same styling options used by the SharePoint team and the Office 365 team. You know, so one key to using Office UI Fabric is that I want my components just to fit in when they're added into SharePoint online. Now, there's also a React component library. So once you start creating React components, why create your own if there's a whole bunch that you can leverage? And we're going to see those in just a second. Now, once I've got this application up and running right here, you know, let's go ahead and once again, you're going to do an npm uh, run start if you want to go ahead uh, and test this. And so what I wanted to show with this application, you know, is just kind of how we get up and running. And what I wanted to do is kind of create a simple uh, single page uh, application here. Uh, and notice that I'm using a nav React component, you know, so that I want my UI to kind of fit in and kind of look like SharePoint, you know, so I'm able to kind of move around to uh, different pages right here. Okay, now as far as this demo goes, the home page, the home view, kind of shows you know how to use the responsive grid inside there. You know, so one of the things I'm trying to get across, you know, is that if I go ahead and I go down into source, 
I go, go down to components, and here we're using the React router, and for every single view, I have a TSX file inside here. You know, but here, you know, note that we have a MS grid row, and then we have these two different columns inside there. And notice that this says, if I'm large, I need four. If I'm medium, I need six. If I'm small, I need 12. And the idea here, you know, with that is that you can see that heading one needs four, but we have a big screen. You know, as the screen gets smaller, you know, you're going to see that all of a sudden heading one and two are taking the same amount. I go a little bit more, and all of a sudden, you know, you have this kind of collapsing inside there. You know, so using this, you know, is really good for mobile, you know, as you're form factor gets smaller and smaller, you know, you want to still be able to uh, work with that inside there. Okay. Some of the other things I want to point out from this example, um, you know, is that you're able to leverage fabric core styling and typography. And so there's a bunch of classes that are defined inside there. So if you go now, you know, into your SCSS file, you know, you're, first of all, you're going to import a SCSS file. And the big benefit that gives you is that as you create your style sheets, instead of you trying to figure out, you know, how to make it look like a Microsoft uh, style, you can just basically use the add include, and that just basically imports their styles and adds it right into your style. Okay. Also note that, you know, there's, if you look at the dollar sign MS color theme light, you know, there's also variables that are created, you know, inside of the core uh, <coughs> um, Office UI Fabric uh, SCSS file that you can use. Okay, now there's also components. So here's where it gets pretty exciting as a SharePoint framework developer. Nope, we're not using SharePoint framework yet, but yet I can still use the React components inside here. You know, so here is uh, an example. You know, if I go over to uh, view one, you know, this kind of shows me how I can do things like use the uh, drop-down menus, you know, or the search box, uh, or the date picker. If I go to view two, you know, this shows you how to use something which is called the details list. If I go to view three, you know, here we're using some, uh, you know, what's called the persona card as part of the React experience. Okay, and here's just an example. I go into my React component and I import the React component and quite often some extra types. Now this persona card is going to require objects, you know, that have a name, that have a title. And so here, what you can see is that I've used the persona card uh, inside here. And the persona card, I'm mapping it. So I'm basically going to add one persona card uh, for each of these elements in the array. And basically, you know, we're able to build that out and get the look that we want. Let's say I wanted to use a details list. Same thing, I have to import the React component and any of the types it uses. With a details list, you know, what do we want that to look like? Let's go back here and kind of look at this details list right here. So what you can see is that you have to describe the columns that you're going to have in your details list. So they define an I column interface, and you create a set of objects that will implement that interface. And once we've done that, now we can go ahead and use details list uh, and basically start getting the things inside there that we need. Okay. Uh, one little call out here if you've never used it. If you're using React, and so, you know, here is an example. Um, of, you know, working with uh, React, you know, maybe I'll go back to these components here. And if I go down into more tools uh, and extensions, I've installed this extension, uh, which is the React developer tools. So what's neat about those is that if I now open just the regular Chrome developer uh, tools inside here, at the very bottom, you can get to the React component toolkit inside here. So now this kind of shows you all the React objects on the page. And so we're at a current route. Oh, there is our app object. Uh, let's go down and, you know, inside of the app object and route, there is my uh, view number three. Uh, here's this inside here. You know, so once again, it just kind of gives you a really good uh, work pad for working with uh, React inside there. 
Yeah, so if you are working with React, I would definitely uh, try out the React developer tools and use Chrome to do your development work. Okay, let's keep going. So now we're going to move into talking about SharePoint Framework web parts. That when I create the web part, I choose to create the React component. Now also, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to move over and cover again a little bit late. I'm going to move over to a different folder where I've already uh, basically done the NPM install. But let's go ahead and uh, look at this component that we have. And so in our case right here, when we create a React web part, we get quite a few files. We got the web part class itself. We have the web part manifest, so you can change things like the, uh, you know, the title of the web part and the icon used. But then we have a separate components folder that has the TSX file inside of it. And also note that they give you the properties uh, defined in an interface. And the reason they define that in a separate file is that the web part base class you know, is also going to need access to that interface. Okay, and then finally, they create that S CSS module for you. So first thing to note is that everything we've talked about, you know, as far as styling our web parts go, means that if I go back up here and we take a look at this classy uh, banner and we look at components uh, and we go ahead and we open this up inside here, you know, so we can use the exact same technique that I used in my last project, you know, where we're able now to do things like, you know, include MS Grid, you know, inside of our container and include rows inside there. Okay. Now, another problem or another issue that you have to work through is that you have two classes. You have the web part class instance and you have the React component instance. If you've worked in SharePoint and you've used the uh, visual web part and you have the web part instance and then also the ASP.NET ASCX file instance and you had to kind of coordinate between the two, we have the exact same problem here. So what's going to happen is the web part is going to create an instance of the React component and that's boilerplate code, you know, that's baked into the web part class that they create for you. Okay. And note that, you know, as we create uh, this particular object inside here, you know, let me go ahead and, uh, you know, point this out. Hello world. You know, we're creating this object and note that when the web part creates the react component, any properties that are defined inside there, you know, we've got to pass them uh, across inside. Now, another issue is typically all the, the place you're writing all your code is in the react component. You know, you want to have data. So generally you go to the react component, and you know you have one of the lifetime uh, cycle methods that you call out. One issue is that it's the web part that tracks persistent properties. So there's this common issue where we want to have properties tracked, but I want my React component to be able to read the properties. Now, with this component right here, let's go ahead and uh, <clears throat> run this. You know, so uh, now since we've switched over. Uh, to SharePoint Framework, we're going to have a gulp serve and no uh, browser inside here. Uh, and <clears throat> let's see, I am uh, <clears throat> probably, um, okay, so npm install. I think I didn't do the npm install. If you don't do npm install, there is this random set of 100 confusing error messages they give you that doesn't tell you npm install was executed. Okay, so if you're working on a new project and it doesn't work, uh, first instinct you should have, you know, is basically to run the uh, npm install here. Okay, now once this uh, runs and I do a gulp serve no browser, we're going to basically jump into SharePoint and we're going to kind of start debugging this uh, right from SharePoint itself. Now, if I look at my component that we're about to look at, you know, it is the lead tracker. And the lead tracker, if I look at the manifest, you know, it's called a uh, lead tracker. I have a contact card inside there. Okay, give it one more second while this thing uh, finishes up here. Now, if I do a go uh, serve and uh, no browser and I'm in the wrong place, 
And let's try that one more time. Uh, gulp, uh, serve, and no browser. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and run this right here. And so what's going to happen is that my local instance, you know, of this debuggable process is now running. So there's this neat trick that you can do. Now, because I need to call into the SharePoint REST API, you can't do this from the local workbench. So the technique that I found works best for me is to use the hosted workbench. You know, there's some issues um, if you kind of use the launch.json file uh, that comes with a debugger in a project. So what I've just kind of gotten used to doing is you can't go right to the hosted workbench because if you're not authenticated, it will fail. But I just go up to any page in the site. So here's my site, you know, MSD. Uh, 0910 SharePoint.com and then we'll move over to the SharePoint workbench. You know, once again, underscore layouts 15 workbench.aspx. So now let's do this. Let's go up here and let's go ahead and find our uh, lead tracker uh, component. And once we find uh, the lead tracker, we'll go ahead and add it in. Okay, now the way this works, let's go ahead and uh, move over here duplicate this tab. Let me go back to uh, SharePoint and note that this particular demo looks for contacts lists. So note that in my site, I've created two contacts lists. So now back here, this is going to say, I can't do anything until you tell me what contacts list. So let's go. And what's going to happen now is you have code that basically is going to you know allow the user to pick what list they want you know and after we pick a particular list you know it's going to you know connect that list and bring things back inside there you know as far as the uh, code that makes all this work if I look at the web part itself you know the web part has some code down here which if I go down here to uh, on property pane configuration start. Yeah, so the idea is if someone opens up the properties pane, you can run a piece of code before this is shown. So this is some code, and I have to give uh, credit to my friend Chris Bryan, who kind of showed me this about two years ago. You know, but the idea is that here we can basically see have we fetched the properties, and if so, uh, Let's go ahead and kind of show them, you know, inside of the UI. You know, here's the property drop-down panel. You know, but now another issue is what happens when this changes? So there's nothing that's automatically going to change the state in the React component. You know, so generally we're going to have to have, you know, some type of a uh, mechanism so that in our case right here, what are we tracking in this React component? We'll pass in a default list. Um, you know, as a target. Also, whatever list we keep will store as a persistent web part property. So when you come back, it remembers what list you were looking at. Okay. And now we have the render method. And note that in this case right here, there's something where our web part needs to have a reference to the React component. Because the idea is the web part knows when the property changes, but it has to somehow notify the React component instance. So step number one is when you create it, extend the code that's added so you track and keep the reference from the web part to the React component. And then what we can do is in the web part itself, there is an on property pane field changed. And so if I go ahead and you know write some code to respond to that, Note that any property that changes, you know, is going to fire this piece of code. So notice that you can also say, oh, let me make sure it's the property I care about. So if someone has just changed the property target list and we look at the new value, you know, the way these things work, they pass you the uh, old value uh, and the new value uh, inside there. And if the new value is not undefined, we'll go ahead and set the state inside there. Okay. So hopefully you can kind of use that and kind of see how it's tracking things. You know, and the other thing about this demo, you know, is it's using the SharePoint REST API. And so here's kind of just your starter code. If I want to use the SharePoint REST API, 
we have the SPHTP client. And what's nice about that is it handles things such as um, sending in uh, the form digest whenever I have to do updates. You know, if you're kind of used to older styles of using the REST API, there's not as, as much manual work. And then, of course, it automatically adds the access token to the authorization header. So you don't have to kind of worry about the security programming. Now, the other thing about working, you know, with this, and we'll see the exact same thing in my very last demo, uh, is that it is your web part class that has access, you know, to these particular pieces inside here. You know, what I mean is if I go back to uh, the web part class, the web part class is the thing that can get the HTTPS client. So note that in our case right here, uh, if I look at the web part and we look at the part of the web part that is going to create the lead tracker, this.context.sphtp. You know, so typically there has to be some way to kind of get this client object from the web part to the React component, and that's just one of the design issues that you run into, you know, frequently. Okay, let's go ahead and we're going to get to the last section here. We want to call to the Microsoft Graph API from a React web part. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, close down everything I've done. We just got about four or five more minutes here. Uh, let's go ahead and open up this React web part inside here. Now, with this web part, once again, let me go ahead and do the npm uh, install. <clears throat> and now let's go through a couple slides. Now, the SharePoint framework includes a Microsoft Graph client. They had an older Graph client that they've um, deprecated. The Microsoft Graph client has gone through a preview and is now out of preview with the recent release that came out last week, um, you know, back at the beginning of September. So it is the MS Graph client. And one thing that's nice is it abstracts away you having to deal with access tokens and automatically gets an access token and puts it inside. Now, first thing we have to do is inside of our solution, you have to add permission requests because by default, we're not allowed to um, make these calls. Unfortunately, it's a little bit cheesy today because what you're going to do is you're going to take your project, you're going to put these permissions in that you require. You're going to basically do a gulp bundle hyphen hyphen chip, gulp package solution hyphen hyphen chip, uh, and then you're going to install. You know, and as you install your components, let me go back here. And if I now kind of jump uh, to the SharePoint admin, and what you're going to see is that to test this out, you have to work with the preview of the SharePoint Admin Center. Uh, and then there is API management. And the idea of API management is that when you push your solution out, you'll see permission requests inside here. And so what you'll then have to do, you know, is go through this approval process. Now, throughout the summer, we've been doing this, and the UI experience is pretty bare-boned. So Microsoft's about to make a big change, uh, you know, to the UI experience and also provide PowerShell support. Okay, but remember, the one thing uh, that is kind of unfortunate today uh, is that when you grant permissions, it's all or nothing for every single solution package in the current tenant. You know, so we hope somewhere down the road we get some kind of more granular permission, you know, where you can just open up Microsoft Graph API permissions for a single solution, uh, but that's not in place today. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use this object, which is the MS Graph client, and just like using the SharePoint REST API client, you got to get it from your web part. So here in the web part, before we create the component, which is the React component, we're going to call this dot context ms graph client factory dot get client. It's asynchronous, so then dot then, and note that now I can take this component um, and I can pass it, you know, to the React component that needs to be able to use it inside here. Okay, now if I go back uh, here, let's also do a uh, gulp serve no browser. 
let me go ahead uh, and move back here into models. You know, so note that we have, you know, best practice in terms of defining an interface that defines the data, defining a service interface, and then we have a class in here, uh, you know, which is going to do the uh, data access code. Now, if I keep uh, going through this, there is another component or another package that we like to install when we do this type of programming, and it's the Microsoft Graph TypeScript type definitions. So you'll have to go to your project, npm install, you'll add this package in place, and what's neat about this is that gives you the ability to use the client.api.get. Okay, so now here's kind of the big picture uh, of going through, and so, you know, what you can see uh, here, you know, is that we call get user. Note that when you want to return a promise, you know, this is a little bit tricky. It took me a, a little bit of time to kind of get used to it. You know, but the idea is that I return a promise because my function returns a promise. Now, inside of this promise that I am creating, I run a piece of code, and then at the end, I can say return, and I can call uh, resolve inside there. Okay, so what you can see here, uh, you know, is that we're able to, uh, you know, get through, get the things that we need. And if I now go and we kind of look at our final uh, demo here, you know, let's go to the uh, hosted workbench. Uh, once we get to the hosted workbench, let's go ahead and go down here and find our uh, user viewer. And we'll go ahead and we'll add that in. And after a second, well, now it's going to get all my components back inside there. You know, some of the things to note is that, you know, we're calling uh, get current user. If I go back here and I kind of look at the uh, code inside the user viewer component, now it's a little bit tricky because we have an individual card. So one of the issues that we have here is that I can get all the users, you know, with a uh, single query. But then, if I want the picture for each user, we need to do that individually. So if we look at the top level uh, viewer right here, the top level viewer is basically going to do a this.state.users.map, and it's going to create one of these persona cards, and it's going to pass the user object, and the user object has everything except for the photo. And then inside of this child right here, after we fill the card initially, we're then going to use the component did mount, and now we're going to call and get the user photo. And so, you know, that's what gives me, you know, this piece right here. Uh, and, you know, coming back here uh, and then taking a, you know, look what happens when we go ahead and run this. Uh, and what you can see here, you know, is that we have, you know, one component, uh, which, or one query that gets all the user information. Then there has to be an individual uh, call to the Graph API, you know, to get each of those pictures. Okay, so at this point, let me just kind of once again call out that, you know, if you like this uh, style of training and you really want to kind of sink in and spend four days writing some hands-on labs and really get the hang of working with um, Visual Studio Code and TypeScript and the whole build process, you know, that's what this class uh, is, is geared towards. If I can just uh, spend couple more seconds here. If I go back to uh, critical path training <clears throat> and you find this particular course down here, you know, which is the um, modern SharePoint and Office 365 development. And I go down to the bottom here, you know, what you can see, you know, is that, you know, we spend day one, you know, really just kind of getting everyone comfortable with Node.js and Gulp and Visual Studio Code um, and developing SPAs with React. And then day two, it's all about the SharePoint framework, digging further into React web parts, getting further you know, into packaging deployment. Day three, we're going to talk about the Microsoft Graph API. We're going to talk about securing applications with Azure AD. And then day four, Microsoft Teams, Azure Functions, and working with webhooks. You know, and if you look at our descriptions here, you know, note that you can, you know, see the full detail, you know, so you can kind of drill down on the lecture topics. Okay, so if anyone's interested, we'd sure like to, you know, see you, ask us questions. Also, if anyone's looking for um, 
you know, mentoring uh, smaller teams, maybe don't have the ability to kind of have a whole training course, you know, reach out to us because uh, we've started doing that for a few of our customers as well. So with that, thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us at Critical Path Training. I hope this uh, hour talking about React and seeing how it affects your life as a SharePoint, uh, as a modern SharePoint developer. Uh, so other than that, we'd love to hear from you. And thanks once again for uh, spending time with us today at Critical Path Training.